Hi everyone, this is Andy Paddock doing my final presentation for IS-185 Computer Architecture and Troubleshooting at Herzing University. Uh, my final project here today is going to be about remote access technologies. So to start off, we kind of talk about uh, what is remote access. Uh, remote access is basically the idea that I'm sitting here on one computer and need to access and do something on another computer without having to go physically to that workstation to do it. Uh, there are two basic technologies we use to do this. The first one, remote terminal, is where you can access a command line interface on a remote machine, whether that be Windows command line or like a Linux shell prompt. And the second main type is a remote desktop, where you're actually going into the normal GUI environment on the desktop to interact with you know, Windows and dialog boxes and the like. So the first technology I'm going to be talking about is Telnet. Uh, Telnet was uh, first developed in 69, although it was a very informal thing. It wasn't standardized until the early 70s. Uh, Telnet is a very simple protocol using a client-server model that basically allows you to set up a remote command line session using just a series of data streams of basic ASCII text. It is very widespread. It's available on Linux, Windows, Mac, routers and switches. Basically anything that has a network connection and uses command line interface, you can probably find a way to tell that into it. Another similar technology is our login. This is a series of tools created for Unix-like systems, allowing you to log into a remote host over a network. Similar to Telnet, but it is less customizable, and you are limited to only remote accessing Unix-like systems. Uh, it dates back to version 4.2 of BSD, and it's actually a collection of a couple of tools. Our login itself is used for logging into a remote system. It has RSH for starting a remote shell session after you have actually logged in. Uh, our exec lets you just send out a single command to be executed without having to start up a full session like in RSH. And then the RCP is used for copying files over the network. Now, uh, these two technologies, Telnet and Arlogan, have some pretty big security problems associated with them. Neither one of them do any sort of encryption, authentication. It's all just plain text data communication. So. Anybody with access to the same network segment that you're using can see the entirety of your session using a packet sniffer, including, unfortunately, the username and password you may be using to log in. And our login specifically is set to inherently trust the network that you're using. If my machine says, you know, I'm host XYZ, it will just believe me and not check and authenticate that. So it's very easy to spoof and just pretend that I am one of the hosts that it's allowed to connect. And both are inherently vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks based on the fact that they don't authenticate who it is that's connecting to them. Uh, here we have a actual packet capture of a Telnet session in progress. And if we look up here, we can actually see that it has detected both the username and the password logged in as well as you know, the entirety of the text of the session. You can see them executing some commands uh, and pinging a server. In this case, we can see it was logging onto an open BSD system, but it would be pretty similar no matter what you're logging onto. Our login session would be similar. You would see everything. It's all just plain text. The answer to sort of these security problems is technology programs called SSH for Secure Shell was designed by Tatu Yelonen of the Helsinki University of Technology in Finland after uh, the network at that school had been the victim of some attacks by packet sniffing and people being logged in when they weren't actually using the system. SSH was designed to be a secure replacement to tell uh, an R login that would fix these sort of weaknesses and it did that through the use of public key cryptography where you can use that to encrypt all the traffic before it ever hits the network so that anytime anyone tries to pack as if it, they just see garbled data that they can't decipher. And it includes replacements for, you know, the RCP, called SCP, for secure copying, and also for FTP, because FTP is similar to Telnet in that it uses plain text and has these inherent weaknesses. 
So for copying files, it lets you use secure FTP, SFTP. SSH was originally designed for Unix-like systems, but it has been broadened and is now available on all platforms. You can do both client and servers on Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, many enterprise-grade routers let you set up SSH so you can log in using keys. The original version created by Lonen was called SSH1, and it was found to have some vulnerabilities with the way it implemented some of the cryptography. So a new version was developed called SSH2, which uses some different technologies and addresses security issues to tighten it up. Now, having remote access to a command line is all well and good. I mean, back when they were developing these late 60s, early 70s, the OS you were using was entirely command line driven, so you basically could do the same thing over the network with Telnet that you could sitting at it. But modern systems, we use GUIs now. We have Windows. It's all graphical, and you're a lot more limited just having a command line than being able to interact with all your graphical programs. So that's where the remote desktop side of remote access comes in. The first one I'm going to talk about is the Windows Remote Desktop Connection, formerly called Terminal Services in the older version of Windows. It's Microsoft's proprietary technology that they include with the newer versions of Windows. They uh, first started it with Windows NT 4.0 Server, and it was originally designed to allow multiple users to log into the server at once and be able to simultaneously use applications installed on it. And the client software is in all versions of Windows since, I think, Windows 2000. But uh, the servers are a little more limited on the like home versions of Windows. For example, you can have uh, limited to what you're able to do or log in with, you know, logging in to, say, Windows 7 Home Basic versus, say, a Windows Server 2008. The features of this can vary a lot because there's been at least seven versions of Windows RDC, but each time they added more and more capabilities from not only just being able to see a session, but be able to, say, forward all the audio over so you can hear events or utilize multiple monitors. By default, it goes over TCP port 3389, and it actually uses Microsoft's own proprietary protocol called the Remote Desktop Protocol. Although it is proprietary, it has been reverse engineered to an extent, so now third-party clients and servers and software exists for it, which means it's now available on multiple platforms. Uh, it's gotten to the point where not only can you know a Linux client machine connect to a Windows hosting the server, but there are implementations of RDP that Linux can host an RDP server and have Windows clients connect to it without any modifications. It is... Out of the box, the configuration for the Windows RDC is vulnerable to man in the middle attacks because it doesn't do full authentication on each side. Although this can be mitigated, Microsoft does have documents on the website explaining the exact steps you need to do to lock it down so you can't get hit by man in the middle attacks with it. But it is also still vulnerable to what's called a pass the hash attack, where when it's authenticating the user, it sends their username across the connection. And it doesn't send the plain text password, but it sends uh, a hashed version of it using a one-way hash function of the password and send essentially a encrypted password. But the way it works is since the server knows the password, it can you know, create a hash of the password it has, compare the two hashes, say yes, this match, you authenticate and log in. But if you are able to sniff a session as it starts and see the person send the hash, um, you're basically using the hashed function to log in, password to log in, so you don't really need to know the password as long as you can capture the hash. So there's sort of a weakness there in its implementation of it. And here we see an example of remote desktop connection client. This happens to be the one from Windows 7. And upon connecting, here we see uh, the actual result as you log in. You just get a normal window within your system, and then once you click in here, you can open up Windows, interact with their remote system, just like you were sitting right at it. Another remote desktop technology is actually using the X11 software. For those who aren't aware, X11 is an open source window management software that's used on most Unix-like systems, particularly Linux. Although you would typically use it on a single machine, it is a client-server software. 
So there's no requirement that, for example, the machine you are viewing the session on doesn't have to be the same machine that you are running the session on. So you can uh, run a session on a machine and then view it somewhere else, essentially creating a remote desktop connection. However, uh, there are some limitations with this. It is very bandwidth intensive. It wasn't designed to be efficient going across a network. So even just running at a very low 640 by 40 resolution and going 30 frames per second, you could easily max out a uh, 100 meg connection. So this is pretty limited technology. You're never going to be able to do this over the internet with today's technology. And uh, it is unsecured, similar to the Telnet and the R login. It doesn't do any encryption of it. So if you're packing it, you could read it and in theory you could reconstruct it and view the session as it was going on. And then in that case, you know, the person, if they're accessing confidential information for your company, then you've got a possible security breach here. But uh, there are ways to secure it. Uh, SSH supports forwarding X11 sessions over its secure tunnel. So you basically create an encrypted tunnel between the two machines. And then instead of sending out basic unencrypted packets from the X11, it uses SSH to encrypt them and sends them over to the other side where they're unencrypted to view. Uh, although you can utilize X11 on Windows using, for example, SigWin and other Unix-like environments, most programs written for Windows aren't going to be using X11, so you are pretty limited on being able to remotely access anything on Windows for it. So remotely using X11 connections is pretty much Linux-only Unix-like systems. Uh, the final remote desktop technology I'm going to be talking about is VNC an acronym for Virtual Network Computing. It's a remote desktop system that uses the Remote Frame Buffer Protocol. And because it's directly accessing frame buffer data, that is just the data used to draw images, it's not locked into any specific system, so it's platform independent. If you're running VNC on Unix, you can access a machine on Windows, and you can go the opposite way completely cross-platform. And there are many versions of VNC. It's a pretty open format, a lot of different implementations of it. And uh, various versions have their pros and cons. You can you know, shop around find one that works for you, whether you want high level of encryption and security and you want to authenticate users against Active Directory, or you care more about compression because you need to be able to access it over a dial-up connection. A lot of different options are available. And uh, one of the really nice things about VNC is it does allow simultaneous sessions with the local session. So uh, another way of saying that is a user could be on the machine locally and I can connect remotely and we'll both be able to see the machine and interact with it at the same time. Whereas if you were using you know, the remote X11 or the Windows remote desktop, that's not possible. If you were to connect to a, a remote machine using remote desktop connection, any session that was active on it basically gets logged out and it just says on screen a remote user is using it and you can't see what they're doing. So if you're doing like a help desk scenario where someone calls in and needs help, having simultaneous sessions really helps in that sense because you know you could as an IT worker can remote in, have them show you exactly what the problem is and be able to show them how it's fixed so that next time they can take care of it themselves and not have to call in, thereby lightening your workload. Uh VNC typically uses port fifty nine hundred for regular VNC connections. And they also frequently We'll use port 5800 for being able to use a actual Java client from a web browser instead of having to have a de dedicated client. Uh, here we have an example of uh, VNC software. In this case, it's using Type VNC. And you can see again, this one has options for different uh, bandwidth settings. So this one happens to be very good at compression. So if you were running in a situation where you have to go over to a remote site that's low bandwidth connection. This can do it. There are many options. You could, for example, drop down to you know, 8 color mode, high compression, and just run fairly smoothly over even a very slow connection. And here we have it logged into a remote system. Uh, again, looks kind of similar to remote desktop connection, the Windows one. But in this case, if I were to go to this remote machine, I could still see the desktop. I could still interact with it. Despite that, though, you can do multiple sessions. So, for instance, if someone was using the machine and I wanted to remote into it but not share the session with them, I need to do some stuff on the side. That's possible, too. You just do a different session, log in as a different user, 
do stuff the user on the machine doesn't need to know anything about it. So that's the presentation. I hope you found it informative and you learned a little bit about uh, remote access technologies in modern computers. Thanks for watching.